started. Good afternoon to everybody who is joining us today. Um, my name is Alyssa Gresh. Um, I'm here for, with the AHLJ and with um, Anne Hertzberg, who is coming to us from Jerusalem, from our office at NGO Monitor. And today we are going to discuss um, the October 7th Hamas massacre and beyond, humanitarian aid, material support, and international law with Anne Hertzberg. And thank you again, Anne, for joining us. So NGO Monitor is based in Jerusalem. It was founded in 2002, um, and Anne has been with NGO Monitor since 2006. And um, so actually Anne joined us last year for another really important webinar on why Israel is not an apartheid state. So we'll be happy to share that with everyone as well. So today, you know, I've really given um, Anne free range on what she really wants to discuss. And I'm really glad to hear that she has some action ideas for us, since I know we're all really trying to jump into action. And the AJLJ has been incredibly active in the past few weeks. So um, we also have our resident, Rob Garson, who has been leading the charge. Um, so maybe Rob wants to give a couple of words before we officially hand it all over to Anne. Very quickly, um, first and foremost, obviously our thoughts are with the troops over in Israel at the moment uh, and the families of all of those who have been affected by the atrocities and those that have been displaced. Um, and are currently dealing with that, and all the workers uh, that are there in Israel, and everybody, and also the thoughts of the Jewish communities that are going on. Um, as people know, some of the work that we've been doing with the AJLJ before the atrocities was dealing with issues like Roger Waters coming to campus um, in UPenn, and, uh, and, and places like UC Berkeley, um, who now realize that they've been fomenting anti-Semitism on campus. Um, and it's come as a surprise to everybody. Uh, one of the things we've been doing, obviously, since the atrocities is dealing with the backlash that has occurred on campus by not only professors, um, faculty, staff and students, um, a remarkable team has been put together. Um, really, a shout has to go out to one of our newer members, Ariella Coleman, um, for, uh, for being at the helm uh, helm of this and what you'll start to see especially on LinkedIn uh, where it w which is our prime professional medium or outlet you'll see letters uh, that are going to some of the major law schools uh, the employers the uh, character and fitness committees etc 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 and and it's to be fair to say that like many people even though it's, we've been caught in our news cycles and our echo chambers it's been very difficult to work over the past three weeks so what we've been doing instead is just uh, on working on what we know um uh, it's time for us to really raise our voices and stand out if anybody wants to be involved please get in touch with anybody on this chat Elisa, Rhonda, myself ariella uh, there is a role for you um and we're doing a lot and bizarrely we're fielding requests from all over the world, from Britain to South Africa, asking us for help. Um, and we are here to help. That's it. And take it away, please. And uh, we'll have a quick Q&A after as well. So thank you. Great. Thank you so much. And thanks to AAJLJ for having me. Um, and it's really nice to see so many uh, familiar names and faces on the talk. So um, I really appreciate the opportunity. I want to focus actually on the issue of humanitarian aid today. And the reason why I have, there are two reasons why I think it's very important that this topic is discussed in depth. Um, number one, in the past couple of weeks, we have seen in the media, as well as from government officials from the UN, a complete shift in the narrative relating to the events from October 7th to now, um, where the sole focus now is being placed upon Israel's responsibilities related to humanitarian aid issues in Gaza. 
And very few people are talking about the legal and moral responsibilities of Hamas, as well as of the humanitarian actors operating in Gaza. And I think it's really important that we explore that. Secondly, uh, humanitarian aid has really played a critical role in the conflict, not only now, but really up to date. And it's going to be the one of the central issues when hopefully the fighting um, calms down. So we need to start thinking about it now, how we're gonna talk about these issues, um, because if we do not really take this whole aid framework apart, unpack it, and then talk about how we can reform it, um, we're gonna just find ourselves in the same place that we are today. Um, you know, Maybe it won't be with Hamas, but it will be with another terror actor. And if we wanna have any hope of reforming the conflict, trying to come up with a solution to the conflict, this is a critical area we need to address. So in my talk, I'm gonna talk, focus on, uh, just give a brief history of got the situation in Gaza, an overview of the humanitarian landscape, the applicable legal framework to that landscape, some of the issues and concerns raised by it, and then some suggested action items. So briefly, I just wanna talk about what the situation in, in Gaza up to the present is. It's probably familiar to mo most of you, but I do find it's helpful to just have a refresher because um, also there may be some aspects that you haven't thought about before and they are critical to know in terms of going forward. So um, I'm gonna start with the disengagement in 2005 by Israel. So in the summer of 2005, Israel withdrew all of its military presence and uprooted its settlements, uh, 8,000 people, relocated them to Israel, very painful process. I was living in Israel then, um, you know, watching the images on TV was very difficult. And, but the idea behind it was, um, it was an experiment. It, the hopes were that with full autonomy in Gaza, um, the Palestinians could develop a thriving situation in the territory. And perhaps that model could then be transferred to the West Bank and might lead to the space to have a negotiated solution to the conflict. That was the idea behind it. And to help make that possible, uh, there were two key components. Number one was uh, James Wolfsonson from the World Bank invested considerable time and resource, money and, and time into preserving the greenhouses from the settlements in order to jumpstart the Gaza economy and the agricultural sector there. And the EU set up a protection force called UBAM along the border to not only um, ostensibly keep the terror groups like Hamas in check, but also to prevent in any weapon smuggling at the border. Unfortunately, these things quickly fell apart as soon as Israel left. Uh, the Hamas came and destroyed all the greenhouses within, it was probably a week or two of, of Israel leaving. And Hamas also almost immediately attacked the UBAM force. And rather than the force standing its ground and reevaluating its terms of engagement, it basically ran away and disbanded. In 2006, there were elections in Gaza, Hamas won, and they formed a unity government with Fatah. In the summer of 2007, Hamas took total control of the territory in a very violent coup, uh, expelled all of the Fatah members. You may remember uh, hundreds of Palestinians were killed. We saw gruesome images that were actually you know, a, a preview of the horrors we saw on October 7th throwing Fatah people off of 17 story buildings. Um, so they take total control of the territory. Around that time, we start to see a narrative developing as well from the UN, from certain human rights groups, that Gaza is still occupied by Israel, even though Israel had completely left the territory and it was under Hamas control. They started invoking legal terminology like collective punishment, claiming Gaza was an open air prison and considerable pressure on the Israeli government to provide humanitarian aid services and to allow the free, free flow of goods into the territory despite its control by the terrorist organization. At the same time, we start to see uh, an increase in violence in terms of rocket and mortar fire 
uh, substantial importing of weaponry and improvements in Hamas and the other terror groups' weapons capabilities. This leads to multiple flare-ups of conflict in 2008 and 9, 2012, 2014, May 2021, May 2022, May 2023. Uh, we also saw very aggressive actions from Muslim Brotherhood actors. So in 2010, we have the Gaza Flotilla, where they are sensibly, um, basically after the 2008-09 uh, conflict, Israel imposed a blockade on Gaza that required that basically they were going to inspect all goods and control all goods going into the territory. So this Muslim Brotherhood actor tried to um, break the blockade and they engaged in a violent confrontation with the IDF, which led to many hysterical condemnations by the UN, by NGOs. And then also very notably in 2018, there was something called the Great Marches of Return, if you remember these. Also incredible condemnations of Israel, accusing it of war crimes, crimes against humanity, um, all these um, claims that you know they were exaggerating the security issues. And looking back on it now, I see that these marches where thousands of people were storming the border was actually a were planning operations for October 7th, because I think what they were doing, uh, because they were organized by Hamas, is they were testing the border defenses, they were testing the IDF's reaction, um, and, and they must be seen in that light, given what has happened on October 7th. But in the past year, uh, the Israeli government was trying to relax some of its, its policies towards Gaza. It had increased work permits for Gazans to come into Israel every day, and it had been taking other measures under the illusion that Hamas uh, was, I don't know, moderating, but perhaps you could, you know, I guess, um, appease them with, with these work permits and other measures. A few weeks before October 7th, there was increased activity at the border uh, which really was ignored, um, you know, was kind of put in the context, oh, it's just uh, them trying to get more money out of Qatar. But unfortunately, we, we saw the horror of October 7th, the atrocities, and we are where we are now on the verge of a much broader and existential um, conflict and crisis. And I just want to mention too that, you know, Hamas is not the only terror actor in Gaza. There are many terror groups that operate. There's Palestinian Islamic Jihad, there is PFLP, DFLP, other um, Islamist groups. And so they also participated in the atrocities on October 7th. We shouldn't lose sight of that. Some of them, according to news reports, are holding hostages. Um, so it is a broader problem besides Hamas, but Hamas is the key actor in control. I'm going to turn now to the aid landscape. There are, according to the UN in their latest aid plan for Gaza, 78 humanitarian partners operating, including 13 UN agencies. There is the ICRC, the Red Cross, um, operating also under the Palestinian Red Crescent. There are international aid organizations. There are local NGOs. And these groups are primarily funded by the EU and various governments, including the United States. UNRWA schools currently have approximately 300,000 kids in their schools. <clears throat> um, it's impossible to know the exact amount of aid money flowing into Gaza. It's around a billion dollars a year, but we just don't know um, because of the, um, the aid frameworks. There's many aid frameworks and there are, um, there are there's a lack of transparency so it's hard to know the precise amount. Um, it's also important to know that even in the humanitarian aid plan by the UN, there are multiple terror actors that the UN is working with and they're listed in the report. So that's of tremendous concern. I'm gonna to turn to the legal framework. There are the actors operating um, to provide humanitarian aid, the UN and the aid agencies operate under what is known as the humanitarian principles. And these are humanity, neutrality, impartiality, and independence. And for our purposes, I want to focus on neutrality and independence. So under the principle of neutrality, humanitarian actors are supposed to abstain from taking sides in hostilities, to refrain from engagement in political, religious, racial, or ideological debates and controversies, 
In independence, they are to remain independent from political, economic, military, or other non-humanitarian objectives. So th those govern their operations. There are UN agreements uh, with the governmental actors and also with the uh, various NGOs operating. The Geneva Conventions are applicable when we're dealing like now with, um, with um, times of armed conflict. The Geneva Conventions are applicable to all sides. For our purposes, the most relevant provision is Article 23 of the Fourth Geneva Convention, which says that belligerents are not required to provide humanitarian aid to the other side. However, they may not arbitrarily block aid from coming in, provided that there is no suspicion that such aid will be diverted. And they can also control uh, reasonable measures for how that aid enters the territory, time, place, and manner restrictions, as well as inspections. Um, so there are, you can place um, uh, regulations on how the aid is provided. Other relevant laws are counter-terror and material support laws. Internationally, the most important is probably Security Council Resolution 1373, passed under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter. And I just want to read three parts of that resolution that are most relevant. The first is, there is a need to combat, by all means, in accordance with the Charter, threats to international peace and security caused by terrorist acts to prevent and suppress the financing of terrorist acts, and to refrain from providing any form of support, active or passive, to entities or persons involved in terrorist acts. Domestically, um, in the US, we have material support laws, um, 18 USC 2339. Other countries in the EU have their own regulations. However, the US is probably the strictest in this area. Unfortunately, however, what we have been seeing is, although there have been extensive allegations before even any action had taken place of Israel violating these provisions, what we actually have been seeing is mass violations of this legal framework, not only by Hamas and the other terror groups in Gaza, but also by the UN and the aid agencies operating there. And so that's what I want, as well as funding governments. And so that's what I want to talk about, some of these issues and concerns, because, again, until these issues are dealt with, um, there will be no real changes in the situation. So the first point to keep in mind is that Gaza is under the complete control of Hamas. And because it completely controls the territory, there has been mass diversion of all humanitarian aid entering the territory. So whatever aid comes in, it is up to Hamas how it gets distributed and the conditions for that aid. And the other second important point is there unfortunately has been an ongoing silence and complicity by UN bodies and aid agencies regarding this fact. And I wanna talk in some of the ways this is happening. So first of all, there's an adequate vetting and oversight of how aid money and aid is being distributed in Gaza. Uh, there is no singular standard internationally for vetting and oversight. It really depends on the country. Again, the U.S. has probably the most stringent regulations. Many countries have weak to no regulations. Unfortunately, even if there are regulations, they're often not enforced or abided by. Um, they often get ignored by U.N. agencies and, and, um, and aid, aid groups. And often we've even seen cases of rogue officials, diplomats, who have tried to undermine these regulations. And the vetting and oversight problem also extends to the uh, partners that the aid agencies are working with locally. They are, um, they are um, with the with uh, employees is a big problem. And also um, how the aid frameworks are, how the ongoing oversight is taking place. And just to give you an example, um, there has also been a concerted campaign that's been going on about five years uh, by many of the aid agencies and their consortiums to lobby in Europe, as well as in the United States, to weaken counterterror and oversight regulations or cancel them altogether. 
And uh, one of these actors is the Norwegian Refugee Council. And basically they have said on record that really they want immunity from any, regula from any regulations constraining their operations. We've also seen complicity by these UN bodies and aid organizations regarding passive or sometimes even actual participation in aid diversion. So some examples, UNRWA, we have seen, um, there have been uh, pictures that have come out from Gaza of UNRWA aid intended for UNRWA to be distributed food aid being sold in local Gaza grocery stores for a profit. There was, they have also, um, a couple of weeks ago, they had put out a tweet where they basically said Hamas was stealing their diesel fuel. And within minutes, that tweet was deleted. We have the very notable case that was about two years ago on World Vision. And a lot of these examples are available on our, on our website. Uh, World Vision, one of the senior uh, employees of World Vision was arrested and convicted for diverting millions of dollars to Hamas. And the World Vision leadership to this day still is in denial about this fact. They organized a campaign of many European diplomats to uh, attack the Israeli justice system and claim the charges were fake and that he had been tortured. It was ridiculous. Uh, they claimed they didn't even give that amount of money that Israel had claimed was diverted. But in our research, we actually found they had a bank account in Israel, which had the amount of money that Israel was claiming to be diverted. And World Vision apparently didn't know anything about this bank account, or they said they didn't know anything. And we even had the most one of the most egregious examples. Um, the head of the EU mission for the Palestinians, who left his position in July, one of the last acts he did was he went to Gaza and he took a paragliding ride off the cliffs on the beach there and shouted, free Palestine. And at the time, the paragliders were considered dual use items by Israel because they were concerned, as we saw how they were used, that they could be used as weapons. So here you have this UN official taking a paraglider ride, screaming free Palestine. And according to the news reports about it, it said that under cover of diplomatic immunity, these paragliders were smuggled into Gaza. We have no idea how many of them were smuggled in or if these were the same paragliders that were used on October 7th. But again, this is an egregious example of some of the things that are going on. There's also been tremendous complicity and silence in violations of the laws of war by Hamas. And these include um, mass co-locating by Hamas of military weapons in, uh, in, in civilian areas, putting the tunnels in residential neighborhoods, use of human shields, um, Hamas was blocking after Israel called for evacuating to South Gaza. Um, Hamas was blocking those evacuations, was shooting at people, on, according to media accounts. Um, we did not hear things from the aid agencies about that. Child soldiers is a big problem. Recruitment and use of children, very little discussion about it. Um, perfidy, uh, Hamas pretending to be civilians abusing the Red Crescent emblem. I could go on and on with the, with the violations. Some examples of how this has played out. After the 2008 and 2009, uh, 2008 and 2014 conflicts, the UN um, set up a board of inquiry to examine damage to UN facilities. And in those reports, they did note that weaponry had been stored in the UNRWA schools. So interestingly, in 2015, I was at a talk at Harvard with the current with the head of UNRWA at the time, Pierre Crambule, and I brought up the Board of Inquiry report and I asked him, you know, based on this report, was UNRWA planning to do an audit and full investigation of how its facilities were being exploited by Hamas in order to take measures to prevent it from happening again? And he basically said no. There were no plans to do any kind of investigation. We're all aware of the types of things going on at UNRWA schools. There's been a lot of reports about that. Uh, UNICEF is another example. They're, they're tasked with the issue of child soldiers under UN frameworks. And in our research, we had found that UNICEF was partnering with several NGOs tied to the PFLP. And we had even found pictures of those NGOs participating in PFLP events where kids were dressed up in terror garb. 
And a few years ago, I had a, a meeting with the head of UNICEF Palestine, and I showed her those pictures. And basically what she said to me was, we don't consider uh, Hamas or the PFLP to be terrorist organizations. And so we don't have a problem with this. Um, you know, that that has been the ongoing response. When we've asked why they don't document recruiting and use of child soldiers in Gaza, their response is they claim they don't have the capability to do that. So they have completely um, ignored that issue. We've seen also in kindergartens where they have these awful ceremonies of kids um, play acting, kidnapping and killing Israelis and Jews. Some of these kid these kindergartens are supported by aid agencies and governments like Norway. Um, I don't know if when they funded those kindergartens, they knew about these types of ceremonies, but they certainly know about them now. I don't know if there have been any strictures on this funding or any, um, you know, um, regulations put on these kindergartens to get the money based on these ceremonies, that's unknown. And we also have the ICRC that um, has, if you look at their Twitter feed for the past three weeks, they've been very critical of Israel, but we rarely, and they're supposed to be neutral based under their governing statutes, uh, but they say very little about crimes being committed by Hamas and other terror actors. These groups have also been complicit in the propaganda war, and this is important because this is another front in the battle. Um, it's a significant front because as we saw with the hospital libel that happened last, two weeks ago, um, you know, there was this rush to judgment to condemn Israel and it led to a global pogrom around the world, attacks on synagogues, attacks on Jews. Um, it could have had tremendous implications for the conflict here. It could have led to an extreme flare up in the Northern border um, completely irresponsible, but it was being promoted by UN actors. And even after it came out that Israel was not responsible, some UN actors and aid groups are still promoting the lie that Israel was responsible. Uh, this propaganda equates Israel, which takes extensive measures to uphold the law and embeds IHL protections within its system uh, down to the battalion level, which we don't see actually in many armies. I don't even think the US does it to that extent with Hamas and other terror groups who have no respect for the law at all, but they're at, these actors are equate, they're equated with Israel. Um, other things that are completely ignored, the short fallen rockets, we rarely hear about that. We rarely hear about um, the Gaza electricity grid was shut down by a short fallen rocket. Uh, water pipes have been stolen and, and damaged by these rockets. And instead, all we hear about is it's Israel's responsibility or Israel's doing a siege, cutting off the water and the electricity, which isn't even true. Um, but, um, you know, they ignore these other factors and Hamas's responsibility for damaging this critical infrastructure. We don't hear about attacks on the border crossings. And this has been going on for many years. Uh, casualty reporting, they just take Hamas's word. Uh, they do no verification. And basically what it's doing, it's giving the UN stamp to these claims. The evacuation issue I have found particularly offensive. Israel three weeks ago started giving evacuation orders so that under IHL, you have a responsibility to separate combatants from civilians. And that's what Israel is trying to do with these evacuation orders. They're doing it in Israel. They've evacuated the Northern border. They've evacuated the Southern border. Um, they're doing it in Gaza. And you had the UN agencies in, and aid agencies fighting this evacuation order. Interestingly, we do not see them doing that in other conflicts. So I was re checking recently what was happening when coalition forces went in to take out ISIS from Raqqa and Mosul, Fallujah, and they tried to evacuate the population. In Ukraine, they wanted to evacuate the population, but for some reason, here, they want the people to be placed in danger and to be placed in a situation where they're being used as human shields by Hamas. It really makes no sense. There has been an erasure of the humanitarian crisis in Israel. We are suffering a tremendous humanitarian crisis. It's not covered in the media enough. There have been, aside from the thousands of people injured and killed on the southern border, tens of thousands, if it's probably more now, over 100,000 people displaced internally in Israel. Even in Jerusalem, all of our hotels are filled with evacuees from the North and the South. 
thousands of families damaged psychologically. A friend of mine went down to a lot this week. She's a social worker to help families. They are tasked with helping 4,000 families who are intact families who, were, who did not lose someone from the South, but they were there and have suffered tremendous psychological damage. Hundreds of thousands of people are not working right now because they are on the front lines. Uh, the agricultural the agricultural sector in Israel is, com is completely falling apart. Many of the people, because they were located in Southern Israel, also in the North, but primarily in Southern Israel, um, the farms, um, there are volunteers now trying to resurrect um, and save the produce there. But a lot, all the foreign workers have gone home because they were afraid or killed or taken hostage. And many of the people who are running these farms were killed. Uh, so, there, so there's a tremendous um, problem in that sector, as well as people just not working. Um, that has been erased from the story. And also there's been an erasure by these actors of the role of Iran, Qatar, China, Russia, very little about Egypt and its humanitarian responsibilities. And I wanna say, and I've been noticing this really from, from October 7th even, that unfortunately, and a lot of these actors have been engaging in what I consider to be atrocity, inversion, and denial. So um, they immediately were trying to erase and minimize what happened on October 7th and the plight of the hostages. And I believe that this humanitarian aid issue is one of the reasons they are doing this. Now, not to say that there aren't significant humanitarian concerns in Gaza. There is a humanitarian crisis going on in Gaza. But the way that the narrative has shifted I believe is to deflect from what happened to us on October 7th. And this is because um, the conventional narrative is that Israel is the evil oppressor, whereas the Palestinians are powerless victims. And what happened on October 7th disrupted that narrative. And by shifting back to the humanitarian issues in Gaza and erasing these other things that I've been talking about, it's a way to shift the narrative back to that. Um, so that that is a very pernicious aspect of what is going on also. And unfortunately, I've, I have lots of documented examples that have been happening, not only from the UN, but also these aid agencies. And really what what the this problem of this complicity and the failure to address these issues is that it has prolonged the conflict. It has made it more deadly. It has emboldened Hamas because they are not required to provide for their people. And we've seen this in, in interviews that it's the aid agencies in the UN that are doing it. And Hamas has no feels no responsibility to provide for its people. And because these other actors are giving all the money for the social services and food and education, that just means more money and goods available for Hamas and its war machine. And also because of the way in which these actors have been violating their script, their um, rules of independence and neutrality, it has led to an, an incredible erosion of trust and lack of self-reflection by these organizations, which has made it difficult to formulate and implement effective policy and to come up with solutions. And so I wanna to turn to solutions though, because things cannot go back to this paradigm. Um, again, please God, the fighting you know, will end relatively soon. Um, everything has to change. It cannot go back to the way it was. So first of all, currently, we need to put the onus back on the legal obligations of Hamas and the Palestinian Authority. We have to put the onus back on actors like Iran and Qatar and Russia and China. And this may include imposing new sanctions, reaffirming and strengthening existing sanctions, um, we may want to think about Magnitsky sanctions against bad actors. We need to force the UN and the aid agencies to abide by the regulations. Um, there needs to be a complete overhaul of the aid frameworks. There needs initially to be a total, an audit and investigation of how these aid, this aid framework has been working, done by credible actors. Um, it could be done by Congress, it could be done by other actors. Uh, international coalition, you know, we can those details can be worked out, but that has to be done, and there has to be new policies implemented to prevent the current situation from ever being reestablished in Gaza. Other types of local uh, litigation that could take place are key TAM actions. There have been key TAM actions against humanitarian aid agencies in the United States that were successful. Um, 
any groups that are unwilling to implement vetting, oversight, and counter terror regulations, their aid should be suspended, if not canceled, until they implement reforms. So this could perhaps be done through legislation. There uh, needs to be enforcement of current legislation, which is not being enforced, such as the Taylor Force Act. And there can be lawsuits uh, related to material support for terror, aiding and abetting war crimes and crimes against humanity prosecutions. Um, and these are, and it has to take place, we're primarily a, a group of American lawyers here, but it also has to take place in Europe. So if there are any people in Europe, I believe these same types of steps need to also take place there. Um, so I will stop there and look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Anne. It was definitely a lot to swallow, but really important information. And I know um, we are all wondering, where do we go next? So I'm gonna turn to some questions. Um, so I'm gonna start with some of our concerns. Um, as we look to raise awareness about how the current climate facing Jews in America serves as a case study for the broader Western security risk that has been generated by the intentional well-funded manipulation of education systems, social, social justice movements, global diplomacy and social media. A, who are the people that we need to be reaching? B who are the people that we are currently able to reach who we were not able to reach before October 7th and see what are the messages that we need to be promoting to these audiences? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I mean, we've been working on, you know, groups like Students for Justice in Palestine for many years and also other BDS groups and just how their messaging um, has always been violent. It was never intentioned, you know, they weren't asking for a two-state solution or coexistence. The message has always been a violent message, a genocidal message, um, and that really has come to a head, unfortunately, on campuses and in these demonstrations we're seeing across the globe, these awful demonstrations, anti-Semitic demonstrations. So I think it's really important that, um, pressure, and I think it's been great so far what's happened, where you have a lot of donor pressure pulling their money from these schools that are failing to take accountability and address these problems. Um, perhaps looking at charitable status of a lot of these groups. Some perhaps, it may even be material support investigations need to take place. Um, I do think it's good that there has been employers um, rescinding job offers, because I do think people need to be held accountable. And I think going forward, um, they can, you know, I know there's First Amendment issues, but on college campuses, you know, there are codes of conduct and the First Amendment may not apply um, to the same extent, you know, on college campuses. And particularly when we're dealing with the types of terror related issues here that, um, you know, they have to look at, at prescribing certain student groups. They shouldn't be allowed to operate on campus. And honestly, um, I do liken some of these groups to groups like the KKK and maybe mem mem um, the types of measures that were used against the KKK need to be um, undertaken against these groups. I, I don't think I'm overstating the case there. Um, so actually to go off of the um, charity status question, um, can we lawyers take action to deny charities like World Vision and UNICEF their 501c3 status in the US and can we claim that they're providing material support for terrorism? Yeah, I mean, I think we have to look at, you know, yeah, obviously I have to look at each case um, individually, but um, certainly I think in a lot of cases there's room to call for investigations. You know, first you need to have investigations by law enforcement, um, the treasury department, uh, to look into these cases to find out what's going on. Um, but even, uh, you know, there was a key TAM action successful brought by an attorney in New York against Norwegian People's Aid because he saw, even though they had been operating at the time they got U.S. money to operate in Sudan, they had been partnering with terror groups in Gaza. And they were actually sanctioned by the Justice Department. And there was a, a successful key TAM action on that. 
And so that might be a model to follow as well. Uh, yes, Rhonda. I know you're raising your hand to so want to speak. So um, I apologize if I missed it. First of all, Anne, thank you very much. And um, thank you for the call out for some of the work that we have been doing and um, re-emphasize what Rob said earlier about joining us on these letter writing um, campaigns. If you don't have our email, just reply to the information you received here also through the chat. Um, so I, I sent Anna a note directly and I'm not sure how you want to talk about it, but can you sort of explain in any rational way how this happened under the watchful eye of when and whether, I mean, you have explained it, right? I mean, that combination of corruption and, you know, there's a better word for that. Thoughts about um, how that can be addressed because one of the things that is coming up is, well, Israel is the responsibility of the national of course, they don't. But can you talk a little bit about? You know, they they don't have money for uh, their food, but they've got money for lots of things like that. Yeah. So as an initial matter, um, one of the things I I'm actually I actually had said this on Twitter. I actually find it to be like an omerta. <laughs> There's an omerta by UN agencies and a lot of and a lot of the aid organizations in Gaza refusing to talk about this mass aid diversion, um, and you know they've denied it for years. When I, there have been a, notable cases in UNRWA even in the past couple of years where two officials basically had to leave the organization for even mentioning that this was happening. Um, so it's like you speak out about it, you're no longer able to work for these agencies. And, you know, for a while they were able to get away with it, but they can't now because as you mentioned, we have these tunnel networks, they're all over TV. <laughs> Everyone is well aware of them. Um, you know, even yesterday on, on uh, I saw a video, I think it was RT went in as to a PIJ tunnel network. These are incredibly sophisticated tunnels and all the cement that's meant for rebuilding in Gaza is going to these tunnels. They have fuel. They've been stockpiling fuel. They've been stockpiling water. They've been stockpiling food. Um, so we see this is not getting to the people of Gaza. But also the other problem with this complicity, which I find very distressing, is it's, it's incredibly difficult, if not impossible, to get an accurate picture of what the situation is in Gaza. And without that accurate picture, you cannot formulate good policy. So it's hard to know how many people are in distress in Gaza. Um, but because the, these, the people that are supposed to be running these programs have not been honest about what's been going on with Hamas, it's hard to take them seriously or believe what they're saying about this, the actual situation in Gaza, who needs the help, where is the help needed? What exactly is the situation in terms of water? For many years, there was the uh, desalinization plants were being blocked. Um, you know, the, there were, there's been a lot of issues with the infrastructure there, uh, again, that's been taking place over many years. Um, and so, you know, that that that's what also these groups need to be convinced by and if that has to, if that convincing has to take place by legal action against them, then that's what's going to have to happen. Because, you know, why are U.S. taxpayers giving billions of dollars to this system if it's all going to just be used for the Hamas war machine? Um, and there needs to be actual oversight. It can't be, um, you know, we can't look away from this. No so, way. yeah. So, Anne, let me ask you, you know, I think another place that we're really getting so much disinformation and misinformation, obviously, is sprayed from the news. Um, I just read this article from the AP about how the casualties reported by the um, health ministry, obviously run by Hamas, are also counted from the Al-Shifa hospital, which is... Um, where um, the operations are allegedly being run from. 
So, you know, there are news agencies who say, well, the only place we're getting our information from is the health is the health ministry. So where else are we going to take our information? What would you, is there something that you would propose and where should they get their information? Yeah, so I mean, this again is a huge problem because it is difficult to get reliable information um, because Hamas, first of all, they're not just, first of all, we don't even know if the numbers are accurate. It's, it's impossible to know. I mean, they've, the UNICEF yeah. yesterday said 3,500 children were killed. Um, that seems to be a exaggerated number based on the types of news accounts we've seen and the photos coming out of Gaza. I, I find that number hard to believe, but I don't know. Um, but also when with these numbers is they're not distinguishing between civilians and combatants. So that's another problem. Um, we know, you know, the 500 people they're claiming were killed in the hospital attack a couple weeks ago are included in those numbers, but estimates actually you'd say there was maybe 10 to 50 people killed. We just don't know. And the 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 other problem is I think in a more functional system, and again, I don't, I really don't understand the mindset of what's going on with the UN and the aid agencies. You know, I, I'm sure many of them have noble goals, you know, they think they're helping, um, but a lot of them probably are sympathizing because there's a lot of local employees, they probably sympathize with the Hamas agenda. And you know, if they were acting in a functional way, they would take the responsibility for doing these types of casualty counts to provide us with accurate information. But that's not happening. So, um, so it's a real problem. Um, but you know, ideally, it would be a group like the UN doing it. Um, but but they're you know at at this rate they're not. <laughs> so that would be something that would have to change in the future. And then how about the uh, International and American Red Cross and their role in the unfolding yeah, situation? So, yeah, so I think the Red Cross has really been an egregious case because the ICRC um, prides itself on its neutrality and it has not acted that way in this conflict. They have been putting out they put out a very unusual statement condemning Israel before anything had happened, uh, which they never do. Um, and there's some good um, responses to that online. Um, one was written by a, an Israeli lawyer named Ori Pomsen, who, who you can look that up. He, he talks about it. Um, they haven't been saying much about the hostages, which is really what you think of the ICRC, trying to get access to the hostages. And I think one thing that we can do is the Palestinian Red Crescent is part of the ICRC movement. And there are statutes of the ICRC that the Red Crescent is required to follow. And that would be getting access in addition to their other, op their other activities, medical activities. They are required to make contact with these hostages and get communication from them and to find out information, but they're not. And so I think there are some very good pressure points, perhaps campaigns to have them kicked out of the movement. I mean, people may not know this, but Israel was not, a, the Jew, the Jewish uh, Magen David Adom was not allowed to be part of the ICRC movement. They would not allow a Jewish star to be used as an emblem. And Israel basically had to rely on a red crystal. Uh, because of the racism in that movement, they did not allow a Jewish star, even though there's a red crescent and a cross. Um, and only, and this was only about uh, 15 years ago that they were even admitted to the movement. So I think we should start a campaign to get the red crescent kicked out of the movement until they abide by their responsibilities. And I think the American Red Cross could also be a pressure point. Um, people should maybe, you know, protest. I would, protests might be something. Um, about the hostages, you know, donations, withholding donations, and other types of um, measures like that to force the movement to actually live up to their responsibilities. 
And what is the legal basis, if any, for the ICRC opposing uh, the Gaza civilian relocations? Are they citing any rule specifically? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, well, I think there are two things. The first is more benign, I guess. Well, benign isn't the right word. The the second thing is is very um is a is a horrific motivation I think but the first motivation is they're claiming it it's too dangerous for the civilians to leave, um, and at the time when they first started saying this they were I think Israel had said they had forty eight hours but now it's been three weeks so okay at the, at the time I could see people coming out with statements saying you know we can't move all these people in such a short amount of time. Um, but there's been three weeks now. Um, and I think it's been disingenuous to say that there's no safe locations in Gaza because as we've been seeing, the primary the primary military activity is taking place in the north of Gaza. Um, and I do think that there could have been efforts made to um, evacuate more civilians. But of course, Hamas doesn't want that. So I think there does have to be some investigation where the aid agency is complicit in that or they, I think also part of the reason is they want to operate in Gaza. And so if you don't toe the line with Hamas, you can't operate there. But if that's the case, then that's really messed up. But we did see that also with ISIS, where these groups were paying bribes to ISIS. And I have no doubt that when the aid comes over the border, they have to pay some kind of bribe to Hamas or they, Hamas takes, you know, a certain percentage of all the aid, you know, and the money coming in. Um but the other nefarious reason is there has been this Nakba 2 narrative being advanced by a lot of these groups and UN agencies that the real purpose Israel is doing this evacuation, you know, imputing this evil motive to Israel is to ethnically cleanse Gaza of Gazans. Um, and they don't want, they are preventing a second Nakba. And I just find that completely abhorrent you know that that okay palestinian propagandists are going to say that or hamas or the pa are going to push that line but for the un and these aid agencies to buy into that i, I find that quite um offensive um yes rhonda <clears throat> sorry so rhonda is it another question we're gonna take probably one or two more questions, but okay, I'll continue. Um, one moment. We do have a lot of questions. Maybe some people will be, <laughs> be able to reach out to you after as well. Um, yes. What is Qatar's involvement with Hamas and why are they involved? Yes, yeah, so Qatar um, plays a few roles. So number one, uh, the leadership of Hamas actually lives in Qatar, in Doha. Uh, they have huge fortunes, billions of dollars. I think we can all figure out where that money came from. Um, so they're living in Qatar. So Qatar is actually hosting these terror actors, which is actually a violation of their legal responsibilities. Um, but Qatar has also played a role. They actually do have aid agencies operating in Gaza. So they are playing that role also. And presumably have been giving a lot of money to Gaza, to Hamas. Um, and they, But they've also been playing kind of this negotiating role. So um, they, are, they have been looked to by both the Israelis and the Americans to kind of serve as an intermediary. So certainly in the more recent conflicts, um, Egypt and Qatar have played a role in trying to negotiate ceasefires, uh, particularly in the 2021 conflict. And so, uh, you know, I think Qatar has been viewed as somewhat of a moderating force. I believe the U.S. has a military base in Qatar. So um, it's quite complicated. But they are also, you know, not only providing material support for Hamas, they're hosting the leadership in Doha. So that, that's something that's going to have to change. I think we might have to start closing out. Um, so I do want to acknowledge and thank um, 
some of our, our co-sponsors. We actually have a number of them. It's very important for us to collaborate and work with as many Jewish and legal organizations as possible. Um, you know, this isn't the time for egos or, you know, ownership because this is a fight that we're all really fighting. And so I want to thank um, the Israeli American Civic Action Network, the JCRC of Greater Washington, the American Jewish Committee, um, and Tzedek DC for um, graciously co-sponsoring. Thank you. Um, thank you and so thank you. And um, this has been a uh, really informative and great. And uh, there will be a recording available, of course, and we'll circulate that. And I think you referred to a number of publications and ideas and people that we can reach out to. So I think uh, maybe we'll try to write up something comprehensive because I know everybody really just wants to do more. Um, so if anybody, thank you again, Anne. Um, if anybody else, I know Rhonda wanted to say something and maybe Rob does as well. Um, so Rhonda. Just first of all, thank, thanks to you again, JCRC, AJC, and um, Dylan Tozier and the American, Israeli American Civic Action Network. Um, I think that it's very easy to become overwhelmed, but there are things that can be done and there are some pressure points. I mean, I, I don't like the American Red Cross is going to mask us at the point of I think that we have ways of saying that um, that demonstrate our power. And I, I think um, you, know, you can join us in a letter writing campaign. You can join us in other things that we're doing, things like this, to us helping us spread the word. Rob? Rob, I've got, no more that, I've got no more that really needs to be said. Um, it's time for us all to stand up, be counted, do what we can. Students need you, professionals need you, Israel needs you. Um, be a doer, not a talker. That's all I can say. And be, continue to be safe. Um, this Thank is you. Second or I'm second. sorry, I'm like feeling very passionate about it, but just. You know, it's uh, for those of us in Israel, I mean, obviously, and obviously everyone around the world, Jews around the world, it's just been so enraging what's been going on. Um, but also we have a personal connection. Uh, my good friends, their son is currently being held hostage in Gaza. I have several friends who have lost children, uh, both as soldiers and um, from the terror attacks on the 7th. And so, you know, for us in Israel, everyone has a family member we're a friend serving in the army. Um, and so there, there's no one in this country that has not been touched by what's going on. And then to see the horrific anti-Semitism that's erupted globally. Um, and so it's just, you know, it's been evoking a lot of passion uh, just about these issues and that, that how we have to really, um, it, it's really is an emergency where, where we need to have uh, changes made as soon as possible. So I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, this is the second or third um, seminar we've had where people have had to listen to a siren or be you know, prepared for a siren. So um, we are assisting in the link as best we can. Thank you for We are very grateful for everything. Actually, one final thing I do want to add, because we do have Ariella Coleman here, Ariella Coleman Coleman, who has helped with our letter writing campaign. And um, you'll be getting more information about this um, tomorrow. We're going to have um, a training session for lawyers and non-lawyers from uh, Jeffrey Lacks um, with SAFE Campus. So um, stay tuned for more information on that. And uh, thank you again to everybody. Thanks. Nice.